Okay, and we are live, but we have to let the stream breathe just for a couple of seconds. Sorry for the delay a little bit here tonight, gang. We had a couple of technical issues we had to lock down for you. But welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle, powered by Overtime Media. I'm your host, Chad Jensen, feeling much closer to being myself, kind of bouncing back from this cold bug that I've been dealing with all week long. But I'm joined, as always, by my partner in crime and my fellow football priest. You know him, you love him. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, today I got to experience the joy of writing a long snapper news <laughs> story at milehighhuddle.com. But the bottom line is, because of the team's need at off-ball linebacker, we'll get to the whole linebacker thing here in a minute, they needed to preempt the possibility of a new addition and get the roster, get, open up a roster spot. So they went ahead and made a decision on who their long snapper is going to be this year. And Wes Farnsworth, unfortunately, was the guy left without a chair when the music stopped. So the Broncos waved Farnsworth. They're going with Jacob Bobin Moyer, who replaces Casey Kreider as the long snapper. Your gut reaction, Zach? I guess Bobin Moyer can snap the ball longer than his competitors. It's a long snapper. I, it, it, if we don't hear his name, that means he's doing a good job. And I don't really have much in, in terms of analysis. I did like Casey Kreider for whatever that counted for. I feel like he was really clutch as a long snapper in field goal situations and punting situations. Oh, just as a long snapper. I mean, yeah, I mean, he was a good guy at that spot. Hopefully, Bobin Moyer, he's from the Broncos backyard. They're, they're familiar with him. He's been around for a little bit now. In terms of long snappers, I, I I wish him well. You know, honestly, Casey Kreider, I'm trying to think of it here. I think he's the first that I can think of anyway, Bronco special teamer to make a Pro Bowl since maybe Matt Prater, circa like early Manning years, maybe the Tebow year even. I can't think of another guy that made the Pro Bowl. Like Trendon Holiday deserved to make the Pro Bowl in 2012, but I don't think that he did. I could I could research it, but – you know, basically, teams go look. We budget anywhere from, you know, five hundred and a half k to a million, and it only for for long snappers each year. We only pay that million if they're you know in year four, year five, free agents or maybe a restricted free agent. And he just got to a point where his salary, Zach, talking about Crater, Crater, excuse me, got to a point where the Broncos were like, you know, he's worth a million bucks a year as a long snapper. We want to pay half that. So we're going to go ahead and let him hit the bricks, and we'll bring in a couple of guys and see which one sticks. But you know what I like about Bobin Moyer? At the University of Northern Colorado, he played edge, too. He was a rush linebacker, hmm. had himself uh, <laughs> quite a few tackles and and uh, rushed the quarterback, and then also served long snapper duty. So he's a lunch pail guy. I mean, yeah, if uh, anything happens to Von Miller, Bradley Chubb, Vic Fangio has a secret weapon <laughs> under his sleeve. I, I thought it might be Britton Colquitt, the Broncos' former punter, make a Pro Bowl. It never happened, though. He just won a ring with them in, uh, in 2015. But, again, uh, I, I we both like Casey Carter. I think he was pretty good in, in his duties, and I think he was pretty well-respected as far as long snappers go among the fan base. We can only hope that Bob and Meyer, the Broncos scouts, and the coaches, they saw something in him. And, uh, again, I, I wish them well. It's crazy how quickly the tides can turn, though, for long snappers. Not to bog this entire podcast down on long snappers, but Aaron Brewer was a guy that predated Casey Kreider in Denver. Everyone loved him. He did a great job. He was clutch. He was key. He was crucial. He did exactly what he's supposed to do as a long snapper for four years. And then as soon as his contract expired, they just said, you know, actually, no. Now that I think about it, didn't they give Aaron Brewer an extension and then like a year in? Ooh, now that's going to bother me. Hold on, I got to do. I got to do a quick Google search. Uh, Broncos extend Aaron Brewer. Bear with me one second, gang. This is going to bother me if I don't search it out. Yeah, he got a. He actually got a four-year extension in 2015. Now let me see when they cut him. I'm trying to remember. You know, most of these type of moves I remember. The long snappers, I, I, they're not in the Rolodex. I, I think so, yeah, that was 2016. The uh, following 2016. year. Yep, you're right. You're right. So they extended him. Gave him that four-year contract and then said, mm, yeah, no, <laughs> hit the bricks. And Casey Kreider, that's where he entered the equation. Yeah. So anyway, but what we want to talk about tonight, first and foremost, it's the Mile High Mailbag, our favorite podcast of the week because we are your football priests. And each and every week we're here to offer you the absolution and the answers to your burning Broncos questions. We can't wait to find out what's on your mind, get your questions ready, get your comments 
whatever topics, whatever super chats, get them ready. We're going to get to them here in just a minute. We also got to talk about Mark Barron. We're going to do that. But first, we got to make sure you guys know how to connect with us on social media. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod. That's how you keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening with the show in real time. And then also at Mile High Huddle. You get those two accounts followed on Twitter. You're not going to miss anything as it relates to Mile High Huddle podcasts and breaking Broncos news and analysis. A gentle reminder, gang, check out the merch store. Get on over to huddleuppod.com and get your swag on. Get yourself one of these football priest t-shirts, one of these football priest hats. There's hoodies, there's face masks, there's there's mugs, there's a little something for everybody. So it's a let them hate shirt. Why do I keep forgetting to to flex that shirt, Zach? Because it's been our number one seller for three weeks. I gotta I gotta get that on the front of my brain. But nevertheless, um, check it out, gang. It's a, it's just another way to support what we're doing here. You get a little something out of it as well. But if you're not in a position to support the merch store, patronize the merch store. It's all good. We're just happy to have you with us, whether you're in the live stream now or listening after the fact as an on-demand podcast. Each one of you can do these three things. Subscribe. That's crucial on YouTube. That's crucial on Apple Podcasts. Like this video and share it out there. That third one, I don't think, Zach, we we focus on enough. We probably should implore calls to action to our, our audience to share more. But if you really love what we're doing here, share it out there and help us continue to grow here at Mile High Huddle and the Huddle Up podcast and reach new like-minded Broncos fans just like you. And then one last thing, shout out to our Facebook supporters officially on the old uh, book of faces. And it's Bobby. She's the bomb. We all know this. Steve, Jerry, Michael, Emmy, Gerald. While we can still name every name, I'm going to do it. Chris, Roger, of course, Chris Hernandez, who was with us last night. Great talking to him. Roger, Jeff, Amber, and the newest supporter officially on Facebook, Chris Pace. So thanks to each and every one of you for supporting what we're doing over there on Facebook. If you are on Facebook, I'm going to put a link here in the chat stream. You can see how to become a supporter if you'd like. Another way that you can, as the uh, as it says, support what we're doing here at MHH. All right, Zach, I want to talk about Mark Barron. But first, we got to tip our cap to the whizzy and the hizzy, jumping in with an early super chat. Thank really you. appreciate you, my friend. And uh, he says, what's good in the hood, fellas? Really stoked to uh, have you with us here tonight, Mundungus. And uh, we're looking forward to to your podcast launch that's coming at some point, I think, in September. So congrats on that and to the gang. And thanks for your support, as always, my friend. And it's good talking to you and good seeing you in the stream. All right, Zach, real quick, back to the linebacker issue. So when we – our last podcast before our break this week on Monday – we, of course, this is the day after the news breaks that Justin Sternod wrist needs surgery done for the year. We floated some names, and the last one we mentioned, the afterthought, as it were, was Mark Barron, and that seems to be, Zach, the one they're going for. They're bringing him in for a visit. What yeah. was your gut reaction to the news, and is this an upgrade in your mind? An upgrade on, you know, yeah. they don't they don't have much there. I mean, it's just for depth purposes, but I I, I would not like this move. It, it's to me, it's Stuart Cravens 2.0 minus the between the ears baggage. He's not a traditional inside linebacker. He's lauded for his coverage ability, and he's not that great in coverage. Just like Nick Vanette is lauded for his blocking ability, he's not this world class blocker. Mark Barron is a tweener. They have decent safeties on the roster. They have decent linebackers, and Mark Barron's neither. Why not sign a traditional three? down thumper like a Nigel Bradham. That's just my preference. Obviously, Vic Fangio and the coaching staff, they want that pass coverage guy. They want that dime backer, that hybrid defender. Mark Barron never lived up to what he came out of being an Alabama product. He Being with the Rams, with the Bucks, he never lived up to that draft pedigree or the expectations set before him. So why would we suddenly think he's going to flip the switch on now in Denver? It's just another gamble like they have in years past. And again, it screams Sua Cravens to me, Chad. I, I'm not crazy about it. So I'm a little bit torn on this because I know that his past coverage grades uh, with pro football focus are not good. We can pull them up. Um, I know he's got some, you know, is he a linebacker? Is he a safety? Is he a linebacker? What is he exactly? He's six foot two and 230 pounds. So I think by virtue of his size alone, he's a linebacker. And even though he came from the safety ranks converted from safety to linebacker, you don't really see that much in his game outside of the fact that he wears a, 
a safety jersey number, traditionally 26. He just doesn't, uh, you know, he, he doesn't inspire a lot of confidence for me. I think there were some better options out there if the Broncos were going to make an outside addition. But, Zach, what I'll say is, like I talked about on Monday, I'm glad that the Broncos are were first looking internally to find a solution to their concerns by moving Justin Hollins over from, you know, it's not a great – decision in my book, but it's better than at least they tried to look for internal solutions. They had a couple of practices. They had Monday, they had Tuesday to get a look, see, and then they had their day off. And then of course today they took off. Well, we can talk about that here in a few minutes. Um, but whatever they saw from Justin Hollins, they're realizing, look, we, we need someone else in here because we don't know exactly what the future is going to hold for Todd Davis. We think we're going to get him back in time, but we might not. And if we might not, we don't want to repeat history with Corey Nelson. I mean, Josie Jewell and Alexander Johnson, for what it's worth, I think they can make hay and get the job done. And I think they would make a solid starting duo for all 16 games. As soon as Davis is healthy, of course, you you replace Jewell with him, uh, or him with Jewell, I should say, out of the gates. But beyond, you know, if something lingers with Davis, you got to have one more guy that you can count on. Maybe, I guess, Mark Barron's going to be it for the Broncos. I mean, you mentioned him playing linebacker, and 230 is so light for a linebacker in the NFL chat. And when you watch him play, he has no value on running downs because he gets washed out of the play by bigger linemen. He gets out-muscled by bigger tight ends, bigger running backs. I just would have preferred a traditional guy on the roster and not another tweener. And I saw someone in the comments said they're grasping for a Will Parks replacement. They could have drafted his replacement. Instead, they drafted three receivers instead. So again, <laughs> when you don't have the guys behind you to build them up, we don't have these prospects same for offensive tackle and guard for that matter this is what happens you're forced to scramble and look for a, a picked over market for a, a, just a desperation option I will say it, if there's one positive from this it seems like Elway's aversion to Alabama products is over now drafted Jerry Judy sign Kareem Jackson bring in Mark Barron at least he's over that spell whatever it was for whatever reason I just am not crazy about this I could see this going down in a similar way as Sua Cravens in that all this hype, he arrives with all this potential as this dime backer, good in coverage, good in blitzing, even though he's not really great in either scenario. And it's going to be, I think, in the end, uh, a very nondescript move for the Denver defense. So I'm pulling up linebacker coverage grades on Pro Football Focus right now. And let me see where I can find Mark Barron. Let's see where he pops up for the first time. I'm scrolling. I'm scrolling here. Maybe I – well, I don't want to bog us down here. He's not in the first – he's not in the top 50. Let's see if he's in the next section here. That, that probably tells us what we need to know. And that's – yeah, I mean, I'm still not seeing him. It's Where not the end-all, be-all, but that's not a great no. indication for his past coverage ability, and that's supposed to be his strength. So if he's not among the top 100, that's kind of a red flag to me. I'm not seeing him. So what I'm going to do is – let me do one last thing here before – let me go back to player grades and go specifically um, – let me go by team. Pittsburgh. He played last year with Pittsburgh. Most of his career has been split between Tampa Bay and the Rams, and then he had the one year with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And for what it's worth, the Rams, you know, he had a few solid years with the Rams, to be honest with you, after he moved over to linebacker permanently. He had a few really good seasons for the Rams, enough that they said, you know what, let's pay him when he hit free agency. They gave him an extension. But then similar to our boy Aaron Brewer we talked about in the first segment, he lasted one year on that new deal before they cut him loose. So, all right. Um, you know, and I'll pull this up when it's not – when the onus isn't on me to talk. The next time you're talking, I'll pull it up and find it and come back with that. But, you know, when it, when it comes to options, you know, at this stage in the summer, I mean, we're literally, Zach, on the doorstep of the regular season. It's August 27th can't believe it's already August 27th. It felt like time was moving so slow during the whole shutdown and this just long, ponderous summer. And already we're at the end of the month. Football's around Thank the God. corner. But, Zach, you know, we all got to keep our fingers crossed because, again, this last week there's been societal upheaval and riots happening in different parts of the country, especially in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and the Broncos. You know, they, they took today off to – show solidarity with what the NBA is doing and in their own way, protest what they felt, you know, their, their view on police brutality, which I agree with, you know, we, there, there should be more awareness. There should be more 
uh, focus on instances where the police over, over, um, well, just police brutality. And so I, you know, they're taking the day. Will it stretch beyond one day? I, I guess time will tell. I don't think it will. I think they'll be back in the saddle tomorrow. I think every team will be back in the saddle tomorrow. NBA playoffs are resuming tomorrow. I understand why they did this, and it goes beyond a game. It goes beyond football. This is life and death, literally. Uh, but you have to go on with business, too, Chad. The season's around the corner. We're in training camp right now. I fully expect the Broncos to be on the field practicing hard tomorrow uh, and, re and resuming business like normal. Yes, but on this show, we 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 stay away from some of the political issues just because, you know, whether you say – up or down or right or left, wherever you, whatever side of a particular issue you think you're on and, and even right or wrong, you can think you're right, but you're going to offend somebody. There's someone out there that's going to take issue with what you're saying. When you, when you wade into that area of, of the, you know, just our, our, our society, I guess. Yeah. Zach and I have been down that road. And so we just, we just stay out of it. You know, we we're here to cover the, the Denver Broncos and the National Football League the football and the NFL show, draft. Not a politics show. Exactly. So we're gonna keep our focus on that. And I think the vast majority of our audience, Zach, appreciates that. Yes. I I've had countless, and especially when things got really salty, not only with the shutdown, but when things happened with George Floyd at the end of May and early June, I had constant um, it was literally constant, Zach, people reaching out, whether it's DMs on social media or emailing us to say that they appreciated that we are just trying to keep our focus on football because football for most people, it's the escape. It's how they right. take their mind off of the realities that are happening in the street or with their job or someone in their family's, you know, sick or whatever it might be. We're that escape. And so that's, that's what we focus on here. Yeah. I put myself in the fan shoe. And if I was a fan watching this podcast chat, I wouldn't come on here to talk about Republicans or Democrats or what's going on with the economy or the election. This is about the Broncos and about football. And I want to hear about that. And we are the escape. It's in our control. A lot of the things this year were out of our control as a society, as people, but this is in our control talking about football and we're going to keep it strictly to that. And hopefully our, our audience uh, understands that and appreciates that. All right. So we've got one here. Let's see here. On, whoops, what was that, John, that I just uh, – who was that? No, I think that was the one I had on. Facebook user. So this is someone from the Mile High Huddle super fan, Denver Broncos super fan group here. I'm trying to see who actually asked this question. I'm not seeing it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Face, Facebook user. Yeah, that was Dom. Appreciate that, Dom. Um, I wish I knew this fellow's name. <laughs> Go ahead, John. Uh, say if we stay healthy on offense, I think a top five offense, and we're going to have a nasty defense. What do you guys think? And Drew Locke is going to have a great year, 3,000 plus yards, passing 200 yards, rushing, and 15 picks. Thoughts? Mm. Again, Facebook user, sorry. You got, you got, you're going to have to give uh, StreamYard permission to show your name, so just figure that out. At, there's a little how to at the bottom of this stream on Facebook, just click the link and it'll show you how to do that. But what are your thoughts on uh, what he has to say here in terms of, yeah, I mean, if they stay healthy, Zach, it's going to be a good offense. There'll be some growing pains the first quarter of the season in particular, I think, but this is a defense that is just teeming with menace and they're going to be able to keep this, this team in games during that quarter when, that first quarter of the season when Drew Locke and company are kind of going through a little growing pains with Pat Shermer's scheme. But, Zach, it might not be as steep of a trial and error process as you might think because this is something Eric Trickle reminded me of uh, yesterday, and that is that Pat Shermer's scheme is very player-friendly. For example, when Rich Scangarella brought in his offense last year and even the Gary Kubiak offense pr that predated that, uh, even Bill Musgrave's offense, which is pure West Coast for the most part, similar to Kubiak's, not quite so much zone. Uh, but nevertheless, very complex offense in terms of learning it, absorbing it, assimilating it. Takes time. Players doing a lot of thinking out on the field, even during the regular season. Whereas with Pat Shermer's scheme, it's much more simplified, player friendly. All of the players, without fail, recognize 99% of the concepts because it's spread. It comes from college, and they all played in the spread in college. 
Coaching, coaching, coaching always makes a difference, Chad. Uh, I, I will say I agree with the premise of this uh, of this statement. I think the Broncos can be an upper echelon offense, top five, a little too rich for my blood in terms of a prediction. Though, if he throws for 3,000 yards and 15 picks, it's not going to be a top five offense. They have to throw for 4,000 yards and just, you know, 10 touchdowns, maybe 28, 30 touchdowns. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't see Drew Locke being that careless. I see him throwing for more yardage. I do see some picks piling up, Chad, because he's going to take some chances. He's he's a natural gunslinger. He has that mentality. Um, but with all these other weapons on offense, you have a great running game in Melvin Gordon and, and Philip Lindsay. You have a lot of weapons for him to lean on. I see it more in a top 12 offense, but Drew Locke's stats being just a little more impressive than 3,000 yards. That's less than 200 passing yards per game. I mean, he averaged that last year. I think it was 204 he averaged in his five starts. So he's going to go way above 3,000. I would say about 25 to 30 touchdowns and 10 to 12 interceptions as a baseline. If they can do that, uh, that's going to be a top 12 offense. And again, if they're a top 12 offense with a top five defense, that is a playoff team in Denver, Colorado. Here's something interesting on, I'll do a quick screen share to shift gears back to Mark Barron for a second here. Hopefully you, you guys can see this okay. Um, bear with me one sec. Let me get it queued up. But let me try and explode it as best I can. But this shows you last year, Zach, what his position uh, snap count was broken down by, by position. Um, most of his snaps, in fact, he 563 out of 750 of his snaps came as an inside the box, inside linebacker. But he also played a few snaps at slot corner. And only one, two, two snaps at safety. So he was almost exclusively a box safety for, or excuse me, linebacker for the Pittsburgh Steelers last year. And then if I go back, let me check out his defensive grades. We can all look at this together. Hopefully you guys can see this. Um, I want his cumulative. Where's his cumulative? Yeah, season grades. Here we go. 2019. Uh, so last year, uh, let me blow this up. His overall grade on defense was not good, Zach. Fifty-seven point five. I mean, that's that that's near putrid. You know, it's below average. His run defensive grade was sixty point one, which is below average. Ta as a tackler, sixty point six, below average. As a pressure guy, sixty-two point two, not good. And coverage was the worst grade that he had that <laughs> the Pro Football Focus uh, awarded him. Came in coverage, so. You know, he's a guy that I guess, Zach, what you, if you're trying to find a silver lining with regard to Mark Barron, you focus on the fact that he is a former first round pick. And if Vic Fangio is going after him with what other options are out there on the market, you got to assume that he feels like he'd be a good fit for the scheme. Other than that, I'm not going to blow smoke up your skirt with, with the Mark Barron addition. Like he's not come last year. Anyway, he was not a good linebacker. He had one job as a pass coverage specialist, and he's not that great in pass coverage. I, I mean, if you pull up Nigel Bradham's stats, Chad, I, we might not have time to do that, but I'm sure he's at least above average. He's been consistent in every stop he's made in pass coverage and in run support. I don't care about draft pedigree too much. Paxton Lynch was a first-round pick. Garrett Bowles was a first-round pick. Shane Ray was a first-round pick. Where is he now? I mean, if you can play, you're going to get on a team. If you can't play, you're going to be a free agent. And there's a reason why he was on the open market. There's a reason why three teams now have moved on from him. He is nowhere near what he was coming out of Alabama. He's never been a premier safety, a premier linebacker, a premier anything. And if he's his worst grade is in pass coverage, what do the Broncos need the most? Pass coverage. They can rock with Josie Jewell. They can rock with Justin Hollins. They don't need another underwhelming defender who's going to take some snaps away from younger players. I just don't like it. If it works out, great. Uh, I just would have went another direction than uh, Mark Barron. So his best season in coverage, according to Pro Football Focus, and look, again, when it comes to grades, you guys, PFF, you do have to take it somewhat with a grain of salt. We've talked about this on the show quite often. Very arbitrary. We don't know how they do their grades exactly. And – they 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 have to make a lot of assumptions in order to grade a player on a given snap. They have to assume they know exactly what that guy's responsibility on that snap was. And I think at, you know three quarters of the time you can you know look at the context around him, see what the play was, and guess pretty pretty closely what his job should have been there. And then also you know how he performed said job or didn't perform. But there's a good quarter of the time there, Zach, where they they're guessing, and because of that. You kind of have to take 
PFF individual player grades with a grain of salt. Now, some of their advanced analytics, different metrics they do that actual measures the result, not the performance, are good. But his best year, Zach, in, in coverage, according to Pro Football Focus, was 2016 when he earned a 72.3 coverage grade. Now, I just want to cruise over to 2016 and look at his actual box score stats. He had over 100. It was, it was as an off-ball linebacker. He had over 118 tackles. 91 of them were solo. So that's a really high ratio of combined to solo tackles. 91 of his 118 were solo. And then, you know, he had a sack. He had, let's see, th- uh, two picks. So pretty productive season, at least in the box score. And we haven't had enough time yet to, to you know, go back and watch tape and study Mark Barron. I'm sure one of the Mile High Huddle guys, maybe Eric, if they end up signing him, we'll, we'll do something like that. But Cody Potter, real quick, jumping in. Appreciate that. Super Thank chat, you, my Cody. brother. And if you're on Twitter, make sure you reach out, Cody, and connect with us so that we can include you by tagging you when, when we give you a shout out, the superstars after each show. He says, I think the real question is, will the Broncos struggle week one with Mark Barron or Justin Hollins at backup linebacker, middle linebacker? I think we'll be fine. I'm not worried. Hashtag believe in D. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's the – Zach, if if it's Josie Jewell, Alexander Johnson, a combination of those two, or Todd Davis is healthy and everyone's healthy, then it's not you're not really worried about it. It's a question of if the injury bug continues to strike and you have to rely on your depth, how are you feeling about the Mark Barron addition? I mean, I can even say Todd see Todd Davis playing limited snaps in the opener if he feels up to it on running down just to give the Broncos a healthy body out there. They can get by week one with Jewel and AJ Johnson, an inside linebacker. But if there's an injury, Chad, you know Tennessee's already licking their chops. They're going to try to exploit the middle of the Denver defense, regardless of Mark Barron's addition, regardless of Davis's health. That is, if there's a weakness, it's that second inside linebacker spot. So they're going to run right at them, a lot of play action to freeze the linebackers and to hold the safety. A lot of Derrick Henry. I think they can scheme around that. But Barron at inside linebacker as a starter, Hollins as a starter for the long term is obviously not ideal. They're good backups. If they sign Barron to be a depth piece and purely a depth piece, I can get on board with it. But if they have designs on him starting, Chad, it's going to be a long year for that Denver defense in those two areas. The same areas that's long been their Achilles heel. My thing is, he hasn't been productive in four years, and his most productive year, he was in the 70s in pass coverage. What do you think he's bringing to a Denver defense four years later after being kicked to the curb by multiple teams? I just don't know. Yeah, it's definitely, <clears throat> it's not ideal, and especially considering some of the options out there, you, you scratch your head, but that's where you kind of have to, in all honesty, and it's not always going to turn out well for you when you do this, but kind of like the old hashtag in Elway we trust. You kind of just have to trust that Fangio, who is a career yep. linebacker coach, yep. knows what he's doing with Mark Barron because, you know, Fangio long before he ever became a defensive coordinator was a linebacker's coach. He was the <clears throat> the brainchild if if you will behind the Dome Patrol, that ferocious four-headed linebacker uh group in New Orleans from the late 80s early 90s had Pat Swilling, had a lot of really good guys on that, uh Ricky Jackson he continued as a linebackers coach. Then he got his first defensive coordinator gig. And then he actually, after two or three defensive coordinator gigs, he had to go back to being a position coach in Baltimore in the mid two thousands before Jim Harbaugh, because he was working for John Harbaugh, his brother, Jim Harbaugh got the head coaching gig in San Fran. And he was like, Hey, who should, who should I hire? And he's like, Hey, Fangio's coaching linebackers. So he hired Fangio. And even in San Francisco, Fangio continued to coach linebackers, while also being the defensive coordinator. So there's at least some comfort, I guess, Zach, <clears throat> in knowing that you know Fangio knows what he's looking for in the right kind of linebacker to operate his scheme. And again, as long as it's not Barron coming in with the expectation of them bringing him in to like supplant Josie Jewell out of the gates or something, right. it's okay. I think you know you get him in here, you let him soak up the scheme, get him you know engaged with his new teammates. As long as it's not a repeat of Corey Nelson where you sign him on a freaking Monday and he's starting on that next Sunday, you know, that's it can't be that way again. And by the way, Zeus jumping in with a very generous super chat, my brother. Appreciate Thank you. Thank you so much, Zeus. So consistent, and we love you, my friend, and hope everything is going good for you in your new digs down in Texas and that you're all settled in. 
and staying safe from that hurricane. That was no joke. That was a cat four chat. Yeah. Scary stuff. Any of our community that are in those States affected our, our thoughts and our prayers are with you and, and um, anything we can do to help you be sure to reach out and let us know. But how much comfort does that give you though, Zach, knowing that, Hey, Vic Fangio, he, that's his, that's his area of expertise as linebacker. He must see something in Mark Barron. I think Fangio is better with outside linebackers and inside linebackers because he didn't really transform Davis into an all-star last year. He didn't turn Josie Jewell into much better than what he was the first couple of years. I mean, uh, he's we have to trust him. We have no other choice right now. He thinks he's the best option, Mark Barron, for this defense. We're not making the calls. We're not signing the checks. We just commentate and analyze the moves the Broncos make. Again, I'm okay with it if he's in a pinch role as the third safety, if he's a poor man's Will Parks. I'm okay with that. But if he's starting playing heavy snaps and heavy downs, it's not going to turn out good for the Denver defense. I am telling you right now, as someone who's watched Mark Barron in every single stop he's had. David Kilgore, like Zeus McPeak, up there on the MHH Mount Rushmore. Bonafide superstar. Appreciate you. Thank you, David. As always, your profile pick, one of our favorite. He says, had a question for Zach mainly. What do you think of Dallas looking at Thomas? And do you guys think he'll sign with them or someone else? Thanks, guys. Give some uh, context here, Zach. Yeah, Earl Thomas, obviously, he was he's the safety. He was released by uh, Baltimore for punching a teammate in training camp. Uh, Dallas did show interest in the beginning. They kind of you know had some feelers put out there. They, they had internal discussions as to whether his personality would jive with the locker room. Uh, and Jerry Jones said it still could happen, but I don't think it's going to happen. If they wanted him, they would have signed him already. They have two good safeties there. And Earl Thomas, his baggage doesn't outweigh his talent. He's not the same Earl Thomas from Seattle. He's he's kind of a step slower now. A guy who was held at gunpoint by his wife for having an orgy with his brother, if I remember the story correctly. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, crazy stuff. I mean, he's punching teammates. He flipped out. He flipped off his own bench in Seattle. You don't want a guy in any locker room. And, and Dallas is, is a very explosive collection of talent there. They're good at safety. I see him landing with Cleveland, Chad. They just lost Grant Delpit to a torn Achilles, the rookie, first-round mm-hmm. pick. I mean, great, great player. Um, I see him going there and staying in the division, going up against Baltimore twice a year now. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Duran Eddings. Sorry if I mispronounced your name, my friend. He says, if you start Josie Jewell at inside linebacker, Derek Henry's going to run for 200 yards in week one. See, I'm not so much concerned about Josie Jewell's run fits. I think he's actually uh, – at worst, an average run-defending linebacker in the NFL. What I worry about with Jewel always is his coverage. I wouldn't. I'm not so much worried that Derrick Henry's going to romp all over the Broncos if Josie Jewel's in there. I'm worried that the tight ends are going to eat, and that the underneath and the and the seam in the middle of the field is just going to be open season on the Denver Broncos. That's my fear. And until Josie Jewel can prove it, you know, he talked about it earlier this week. I want to say after Tuesday's practice. The Broncos made him available via Zoom, and we got a chance to hear from him. And he's, you know, he wants a, a chance to be the starter again. And Todd Davis is in a contract year, and I think there's a better than average shot that he's going to leave next year. The Broncos, this is his last hurrah as a Bronco, and this is his audition. This is his chance to prove to everybody that Josie Jewell, that is, that he can be that starter solution next to Alexander Johnson for the long term, and. It would come at the most opportune time as well, Zach, because next year will be Josie Jewell's contract year. So we'll see. But again, but to back to what Durant's saying here, I'm not so much worried about his run defense with Josie Jewell. It's always coverage. Yeah, and you know what? Regardless of who's starting at inside linebacker, I think the Broncos' game plan for this game will be to stop Derrick Henry and, and sell out to make Tannehill beat you. So they, whether that's Josie Jewell or Davis or Mark Barron inside linebacker, they're going to commit a bunch of resources, put eight, seven in the box to stop the run and make Tannehill beat you. You did mention tight ends, though. They don't have a great collection of receivers. They do have a tight end in Jonu Smith taking over for uh, Delaney Walker. He's like a Darren Waller light. He can cause some mismatches. And this is what I'm saying. If Mark Barron, uh, his coverage flaws come back and, and bite him in Denver, you're going to see the same thing you've seen the last three years with tight end just waving at the Broncos defense as they pass him by. So I would expect if they can stop John New Smith and, and they can deal with those tight end woes and stop Derrick Henry, they're going to come out okay because Tannehill is not beating this Denver defense, Chad. As Christy points out here, and it's good to have you in the stream, Christy. And as from what we understand, Christy is going to be involved in this new podcast that Mundungus is cooking up. So we're all excited to see how that shakes out. But Christy, she says, 
maybe Josie Jewell will be better this season. And I think there's reason to be optimistic. And honestly, all you have to do is boil it down to this is his third year and it's his second year in Fangio's scheme. In fact, Fangio on Monday was asked about Josie Jewell and he said, look, he's a guy that when he learns the finer things, the fine points of a, a defense and the checks and the calls and you know the, what he gleans from film study and all that, he's a guy that can put that knowledge to use. There's some guys that can be taught and, and learn the fine things, in other words, that do not do a good job of then translating that to their advantage on the field. Josie Jewell is a guy that can do that. And, you know, if Todd Davis ends up being, you know, delayed getting back on the field or if there is some kind of setback, Zach, in his recovery and Josie Jewell has to start, I'm really not losing any sleep over Josie, Josie Jewell being a starter next to Alexander Johnson. I think that, you know, I do think Christie's onto something here that there's a good chance he could be better this year by virtue of his experience and also the fact that, you know, he's year two in Fangio's scheme. Better than what, though? I mean, relatively speaking, it's like saying Garrett Bowles could be better this year. When the bar is set so low, it doesn't take much for him to be considered better than he was. But at least he's motivated. Like he he mentioned, he thinks he should be a starting inside linebacker in the NFL. He thinks he should have more play time with the Broncos. You want that? Go out and prove it. If you get the call and if you can be consistent and you are uh, can just hold up, you could be adequate in pass coverage, you have a chance to start for the long term, next to A.J. Johnson. There's no guarantee they're going to bring back Todd Davis. Obviously, Mark Barron is just a temporary uh, Band-Aid right now. They're they're dying for a young inside linebacker to step up. And Josie Jewell, if he's motivated enough, we, he had the talent in Iowa, he had the talent in college, if that can start to translate now, you might have something there. Miles Mixon on Facebook, we love our Facebook community, jumps in to say, do you think Garrett Bowles will turn his game around? Because he already got his fifth-year option declined. So if he doesn't do good, what was that he's out of here? So I was just wondering if he was going to change the way he plays. Hey, man, we're all wondering, Miles. But here's the thing. We've talked about this um, ad nauseum, and so I'm not slighting you for asking the question. For all we know, you're a brand new listener to the show. Here's the thing with Garrett Bowles. He finished really strong last year, and we actually got a chance to hear from Bowles last week. He credited Mike Munchak. He credited Drew Locke. And his partner next to him there, Dalton Reisner, for his turnaround. And it's his opinion that he's turned a corner. And the Broncos, obviously, Zach, they're not convinced of that because they didn't, right. Miles points out here, give him the fifth-year option. But if if the, if the we believe that Drew Locke's five games last year can give him momentum heading into 2020, why would we disbelieve that Garrett Bowles' really good finish to the season wouldn't also serve, hopefully anyway, as some kind of momentum heading into 2020. So I'm cautiously optimistic with Bowles. He's he's been solid so far in camp, and you know, it, we're, it's just one of those things where we're going to have to wait to see how it unfolds week one. I think we'll know pretty early, to be honest with you. Yeah. If week one comes and goes, and he's not the recidivist, you know, perpetrator of holding foul after holding foul, I think it's okay at that point to really be geeked up and hopeful on Bowles. This kind of echoes my last answer when I mentioned Garrett Bowles as to the bar is so low with him. I mean, will he turn his game around that? What do you mean by that? Will he become a consistent starter? Will he, you know, not commit holding penalties? Will he not sink the Broncos offense? Will he make the Pro Bowl? I don't know about some of that, but I'm with Chad. I think I'm I'm hopeful. I'm cautiously optimistic that Garrett Bowles can be just a competent average left tackle. If he can be that as the weak link on the offensive line, they'll be just fine. I, I think Munchak in year two will have a way to finally get through to Garrett Bowles, who's in year four now. Leroy on Facebook says, is Darren Lee available? Now, most fans can remember there was a time when a lot of Broncos fans, Zach, were clamoring for the team to trade with the New York Jets for Darren Lee. It didn't happen. He ended up in Kansas City. Didn't work out well. He's still sitting out there on the free agent market. For a reason. Same same reason that Mark Barron was out there. They're just they're they're tweener linebackers. They're not one or the other. And in today's NFL, yeah, it is a passing league, but there's plenty of inside linebackers that fit the mold, that look the part, and that can stay consistently productive on the field. I wouldn't have liked Darren Lee any more than Mark Barron. I wanted a traditional inside linebacker like Nigel Bradham. Um, a lot of Broncos fans last year wanted Darren Lee before the draft, and then they wanted Devin Bush, and that didn't happen. So they, we all forgot about Darren Lee. But, uh, yeah, there's a reason why he's still a free agent. That's all I'm going to say. Andrew Morrow jumping in. 
on Super Chat. Really appreciate Thank that you, generosity, Andrew. Andrew. He says, thanks for the live stream, guys. Any word on the Fantasy League? Talking about the MHH Fantasy League. I have I have to head out, but if there's any mention, I might have missed my email. He provides his email. Thanks, guys. God bless and go Broncos. Zach? Yeah. I guess we just have to we just have to buckle down and get it set up, and then we can start moving forward, and bringing people into the league, and just bite our, bite the bullet, get down to business, get that done. But it's hard when you're covering a team to find the time to do that, which is why when Two it comes teams. to our the exactly and when it comes to fantasy, though, it's like the last thing we do is organize the team, mm-hmm. like right in the nick of time to or the league to uh, have the draft. But your answer. We, we, what I can tell you right now is there's going to be a league. I've gotten some uh, people have reached out to me about the league. We will make it happen. We will get everyone who wants to play in. I'll put out something soon on Twitter as like a, a sign up sheet, more or less. If you want to play, just respond to that. We will get it set up. We will, we will aim to have more news by Sunday's show as to the league this year. It's going to happen though. Rest assured. Uh, D- David Litton on Facebook says, What if Mark Barron doesn't sign a deal? Darren Lee, bring Logan Ryan or maybe Eric Reed. I just want the Broncos defense to be like the 2015 season, a nasty defense. It doesn't seem like that's going to happen, David, as far as the Logan Ryan or Darren Lee thing. And for what it's worth, man, Devontae Bosby is playing really well in training camp so far and is probably – the coaches aren't going to say it quite yet, but he's probably this close from locking down that number three corner role. Yeah. I don't, and then you got Devonte Harris, who's had his flashes so far. You got a rookie third round pick, Michael Ojemudia, and then a another former third round pick, and Isaac Yadon, that the team really needs to figure out what they're going to do with him. Like, is he ever going to be a guy you right. can count on? Because if he goes three years in a row without locking down a, a contributor role on defense, not just being a depth guy, you know, eventually you got to face facts, and he might just end up being one of those third round pick Zach that plays out his rookie deal and quietly disappears into the NFL. The Broncos let him go, but it seems like, you know, Mark Barron is what the Broncos are going with in terms of their solution to linebacker depth, but he's got to pass the two stage CV test. And then if that happens, he passes flying colors. He looks like with the roster now being at 79, they got a spot ready for him. Barring anything unforeseen, he's the guy. If, if Mark Barron doesn't work out, the Broncos aren't going to sign another veteran inside linebacker. I think at that point they would just go with the guys they have and they would make try to make chicken salad out of you know what they have on the roster, which is not chicken salad. Um, I, I don't know. I, it's a hard question for me to answer. I don't want Eric Reed. I don't want Darren Lee. Logan Ryan would have been nice, but obviously the Broncos don't want another uh, cornerback. It's it's a take it day by day, you know. It's a fluid situation, Chad. They hope Mark Barron is the answer, and if he's not, I don't see them taking another gamble on a washed over veteran. Chris Hernandez, that's right. Shout out to the champion from the MHH Fantasy League last year. Credit to you, my friend. All right, Mundungus the Wizzy, bring in some funny and actually a good question too, Zach. <clears throat> You're playing whack a mole, McDaniel's, Vance Joseph, Bowles. Juwan James, Joe Flacco, Paxton Lynch, Brock Osweiler, Rich Gangarello, Jeff Hyerman. They all pop up at the same time. Who do you smack first? Zach, who are you whacking down right out of the gates? Gee, am I in hell right now, Chad? What kind of question is this? <laughs> like, I would uh, – God, that's that's a really good question. Let's see. McDaniels doesn't have – I don't have the emotional investment. Vance Joseph, that's a possibility. Not James – not Paxson, not Osweiler, not Skangarello, not Hireman. It's going to come down to me to Vance Joseph or Joe Flacco. And I'm going to go VJ because uh, he was there for two years and he brought the Broncos from an esteemed world champion to a joke in a matter of one season. And the worst year the Broncos have had in quite a while from, me, from day in and day out in 2017. So I'm, uh, I'm aiming that mallet right on VJ's face. Here's why I'm not. <clears throat> At first I thought McDaniels, but here's why I wouldn't pick McDaniels in this scenario because you kind of had to wander the desert a little bit and go through the pain in order to come out on the other side. And if it's not for McDaniels, you don't get Tim Tebow. Yeah. I understand he dealt away Jay Cutler and you never know what could have been with Jay Cutler if he stays a Bronco, but that's put that to the side for just a second without McDaniels, you don't get Tim Tebow without Tim Tebow in 2011. You don't get Peyton Manning in 2012, or at least it's my opinion you don't get Peyton Manning in 2012 because the Broncos had not made the playoffs since 2005. Okay. And when the 2011 season rolled around. 
So for half a decade, similar to kind of where they're at now in terms of profile and the league and whatnot, they were mostly viewed as a dumpster fire, very short term, but a dumpster fire nevertheless. And that season in which they went from the seller to win in the AFC West. And then, you know, every game was sensational. It comes down to the wire, huge ratings. Tebow mania takes off. The Broncos are now squarely back in the public eye. And by virtue of that, it also showed how much talent the Broncos had cooked up by, you know, not every pick McDaniels made in the draft was bad. And John Elway had a nice class in 2011. The rookies that year were playing really, really well. And honestly, it's probably one of his best draft classes now, 10 years in retrospect. So all of a sudden, Peyton Manning, when he makes his, when the Colts cut him and he has to make his decision, the Broncos are much more front of brain for Peyton Manning by virtue of Tim Tebow. So I'm, that's a little tangent. I didn't even answer the question. That's why it's not McDaniels for me. It's Paxton Lynch here if I'm picking mm. one. It's either VJ or Lynch. I'll say Lynch, though, just because missing out on Lynch, think about it. The Broncos had, in 2016, still a Super Bowl caliber defense. They went 9-7 and seven with Trevor Simeon. It was supposed to be Paxton Lynch, though. It was supposed to be a first-round pick quarterback that could lead the team. And because they – missed on Lynch because he was a categorical bust. The Broncos wandered for four and a half years in the QB desert. Well, is it three and a half? 16, 17, 18, 19. Yeah, three and a half years in the QB desert until Drew Locke finally emerges with five games left to go in 2019. So Paxton Lynch, honestly, you blame Elway for that pick, but it's Lynch is the primary. He's the, he's the, he's the fulcrum for really, if you boil it all down, the pain. Broncos fans suffered for that three and a half years and the pain of watching him dab on video. <laughs> I can't erase that from my mind, Chad, the dorkiest dabs literally in the history of <laughs> earth, you know, some dudes can do the dab and they, and they look cool. You know, that's the whole point of it. Yeah. But leave Celebrate. it to Paxton to kill it though. He definitely did that. Um, all right, real quick. I got to hop back on and make sure it didn't skip somebody. Bear with me one sec here, gang. We got a really active, phenomenal chat going here tonight. And let me see who. All right, Jake. Jake Gerard jumping in. Stud. Appreciate you, my friend. Bonafide superstar. He says, NFL starts in 14 days. Broncos wow. get their first win in 18 days, which means our depth chart should be finalized by next week, right? Or do you think it'll be close to game day? 10,000 subs is coming up fast. Yeah, it'll be here soon. Once football actually kicks off, we'll be to 10K very, very soon. So thank you, Jake. And uh, so here's here's the deadline. NFL teams have until September 4th to issue their first depth chart of the year. So you're still at that point, Zach, 10 days away from the season opener when the deadline day comes. So, yeah, I'm thinking next week sometime the Broncos will, will uh, issue their first depth chart, but it's not necessarily going to be the final depth chart leading into week one. Right but at least give us some insight on how the coaches are viewing certain competitions. And you know what? I think most of it is pretty cut and dry. We can predict most of that right now, Chad, in, in terms of who's going to be starting and who, who's injured right now and who's on top of the positions. The, the depth charts that matter are in the season week by week when things can change and the coaches, like last year with Purcell and Johnson's addition to the defensive lineup. The depth chart didn't have them at first, but we all saw what happened when they put him in. So don't read too much into the first depth chart. Things can and will change a lot over the course of the season. All right, John, give me the Mundungus about James one if you have it because I'm not seeing it on my – oh, no, I've got it. Mundungus jumping back in. Thanks, my friend. Appreciate you, bro. He says, James is the kind of guy, Juwan James, that thinks that the white border around a stop sign <laughs> makes it optional. <laughs> I sounds, sounds like, right. dude, I know you're you're cooking up a podcast career, Mike, but it sounds like you need to start cooking up a stand-up career too, my friend, bringing the funny. You know, I consider myself to be, Zach, I think any kind of sports journalism, journalism at all, you got to have some kind of a creative spark. You got to be a creative person. And not in certain terms of sitting down and like painting something or, you know, writing a song, but you have to have the ability to bring something vague and abstract and bring it into clear, you know, you got to create something out of nothing. In other words, when you're telling a story, uh, even if you're just reporting on something, 
but I've often thought about, so, you know, I think we, we both say we're creative people in that sense. I've often thought about comics who have to come up with jokes and not just a punchline or a joke. Like you have to set it up, right? You got to posture it. You got to all that stuff, man. It's just a whole nother level uh, of creativity and, and talent. And Mondungus might be something you want to look at down the road, doc. It reminds me of that movie with Adam Sandler where he plays a comedian. It was it funny, funny people? Funny people. I think it yeah. was. Yeah. That was a great movie showing kind of that. like the, uh, the, uh, the depths of being a comedian and the toll it can take on you. A really good movie. It reminded me of that. Yes. It's kind of a dramedy because he's battling cancer right. in the movie. You know, he kind of rediscovers himself and his love for comedy along the way. But there are some really good yeah. jokes in that movie. Uh, Terry Randall jumping in north of the border up there, north of the 49th parallel, proving that Broncos country is not a geographic location. It is a state of being. Appreciate you, my brother. And he's given props to Chris from last night who did rock it. It was so yes. fun talking to Chris and we look forward to having him back on the show again here in the near, very near future. Um, thank you, Terry, my brother and you as well, by the way, we'll have to get you back on the show in the near. We got a few, uh, by the way, I got to look at something real quick. Let me pull out my phone. I'm try. I tried to avoid making the same mistake here. So let me look at something real quick for September. Glenn Hauser. Glenn, you still on for Wednesday? Let us know. Confirm. Next Wednesday, we plan on having Glenn Hauser as the next superstar segment. Dustin wants to know, where do I get merch? Ask and you shall receive, my friend. I'll put the link right here in the chat stream, but it's really easy to remember. HuddleUpPod.com. HuddleUpPod.com. Link in the stream. Appreciate you. All right, let's see here. What else we've got? Question wise, topic wise, it's on the, the people's mind. Mundungus again. <laughs> All right, let's see. Appreciate the super chat. He says, uh, James is the kind of guy that won't step on a crack because he doesn't want to break his mother's back. <laughs> I was guilty of that too when I was in fourth grade. Yeah, exactly. Oh, man. <clears throat> so many of the Broncos' problems right now offensively would not be problems if Juwan James doesn't opt out. Um, Black Knight, <clears throat> 232, wow. jumping back in with very Thank generous you. super chat. Appreciate you, my friend. means a lot to us. And it's good having you in the streams again here lately. So welcome back. He says, is it time to move on from our strength and conditioning coach? Lauren yeah. Landau is his name. I feel like a lot of the injuries are happening under his watch and it's worrying me. Zach, this is something, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like you don't criticize a player for getting hurt. It's, it, it's technically faux pas to criticize a strength and conditioning coach when players get injured in that same it's, you know, the rationale is the same. However, we are the type of guys that don't believe much in coincidence. Yes. And just like we had to question what was happening to the chargers, all those, you know, that three or four year run, man, where they were just the walking wounded year in year out. We're thinking, what is that strength and conditioning coach staff doing down there? You have to wonder a little bit with Lauren Landau, but again, or I should say, I understand why fans really question that, especially all the soft tissue, lower leg. Zach, but what's crazy about it is all of the players swear by him. He was a the guy they would go to privately pay their own money to train with before he became officially orange and blue. So what's your thoughts here for Black Knight? You know who was beloved by his players? Vance Joseph. It doesn't mean anything to me, Chad. If he can do his job and the Broncos stay healthy, that's his main focus. Not being buddy-buddy, not being friends with the players, not having that reputation of being keeping them healthy and keeping them productive on the field. And to this point, it hasn't been that. I, I excused it at first uh, a couple years ago when he was hired. I said, okay, it it's part of the game that happens. Last year, more of the same. This offseason, more of the same. This training camp, more of the same. I mean, Chad, we've been saying this now for two years, and slowly Black Knight's joining us on the dark side here. It's not. It's well past coincidence. It's well past trend. I think they're doing something wrong in their regiment. I don't know if they're pushing them too hard or not stretching enough. I, I, I can't claim to be privy to that, but – it's it's a lot. When you have Vic Fangio saying soft tissue and then same, 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 that's bad. That, that can't happen, Chad. Pandemic or not? He, Vic Fangio, for what it's worth, he fell on the sword a little bit with regard to taking the onus, the responsibility, because he thinks they pushed it a little too hard on the ramp-up period. You know, the acclimation period. Uh, um, there was another word, that the actual word they were calling it. Maybe it was acclimation period. But where they go from hour and a half 
to, you know, hour and, uh, and three quarters to two to two and a quarter to two and a half hours and then ramp it back down. That whole build up period, he thinks maybe they pushed it a little too hard, which is why Monday they dialed it back. Tuesday they kind of got back to business, but Monday was supposed to be another fully padded, fully physical practice. But in the wake of the injuries on Sunday, especially with losing Justin Sternod, Fangio kind of went, mm. and the, the reason I bring this up, Zach, is only to, to add additional context in that a strength and conditioning coach, he doesn't have full control on what actually happens on the practice field, how intense the practices are, you know, how long the players practice. That's up to the head coach. So in that sense, there is some complicity this year anyway, shared with Vic Fangio. But the whole thing, man, this is something that we've taken a few fiery darts on over the last two years with regard to Lauren Landau is we do question it. We do wonder, you know, we're not necessarily point fingers and we certainly would never call for anyone's job, but we do question mm. the, the connection. <laughs> yeah, I also have been saying this for, uh, you know, about a year now since Fangio has been on the job. I think he's pushed the Broncos a little too hard in his practices. I know he's an old school kind of, you know, nose to the grindstone kind of coach, but two hour practices day in and day out, having shells on, not just pads, but uh, I mean, having pads, but not shells. It's something I've blamed him for as well. It's not just Lauren Landau, but Lauren Landau preceded Vic Fangio, and the injuries were there when Landau was there. We got Draven Michael on Facebook <clears throat> who says, uh, if we're on the offensive line topic, Elijah Wilkinson, yes, not fully healthy, has been burned over and over in camp. True. When do we fix this or do we risk Locke's health? I think – there's still reason to be hopeful that the Broncos snap out of this and go, what are we doing? DeMar Dotson's eight years, consecutive eight year starter, at right? Tackle an 11th year veteran. Let's just go ahead and quit fooling around and put DeMar Dotson in at right tackle. Is he the second coming of, you know, Mitchell Schwartz? Of course not. You know, he's not an elite level right tackle, but he's a, he's an experienced, competent, consistent, Yes. right tackle. And in, that's what you don't get with Wilkinson. He just lacks the athleticism and foot speed to hold up on the edge against the speed rushers, Zach. And, you know, that's reared its ugly head early and often in training camp thus far. Yeah. I, I don't understand why uh, they're not waiting. Just get him in for the first team and be consistent with that. Wilkinson, as we've been saying almost every podcast for a year plus now, he's not a tackle. He's barely a guard. He's a depth player, a backup player. And you sign a guy who has nine years of starting experience and you put him with the third and second string when you're in uh, two weeks out from, from your first NFL uh, regular season game. I don't agree with it. Hopefully by week one, which I'll continue to hold firm to, Dotson is your starter and Wilkinson's the backup. We got Ron Dove, one of our longtime listeners and superstars here in the community, jumping in on Super Chat. Thank you, Ron. Appreciate you, my friend. Yes. He says, hey, guys, who are the Broncos' main competition for a wild card spot this year? He says, I see it being the Colts, Steelers, and Bills. What say you? Zach, what are your thoughts? Those are three really good – Ron, yeah. you and I seriously share a brain a lot. Those are three really good calls there. I think the Colts are going to be good this year. The Steelers, you know, Lamar Jackson's in that division, but I think Ben is going to come back with a vengeance this year. Uh, he was looking good before that elbow injury. The Bills could win that division. They might not be a wild card. I mean, they could take it from the Patriots. I agree with you, though. Among these three, I, I can't think of another team off the top of my head. Not the Browns. Tennessee, you know, maybe. Tennessee, maybe. The, the Texans, I don't see it. Those are three really good calls there, though, Ron, for sure. Um. What about the Raiders? You think the Raiders are going to have what it takes to push for wild card this year? There'll be like an eight and eight team who'll kind of be, you know, mathematically alive in week 16 and 17. I just don't see a playoff team in Oakland just yet. They'll be better than they were, but not a playoff team. There's going to be that one obligatory team that comes out of nowhere that you just didn't see coming. Well, it's hard to predict who that's going to be, but Ron, I think you, as you, as Zach said, I think we're all sharing a brain on the three primary culprits that are going to, the Broncos yeah. will be vying with there. Uh, we got uh, Mundungus jumping back in again. The jokester, the wizard. Thank you. Appreciate you, my friend. He says, James is the kind of guy that doesn't give a courtesy flush when there are other people in the restroom. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, more, more poo poo humor on the Huddle Up podcast. The, the trolls are going to be pissed. But yeah, I mean, wouldn't surprise me, Mike. You might be onto something there. All right, we got one here from, oh, just did a jump. Bear with me one second. Oh, Cody. Cody, I see your uh, 
email address, but I'm not going to be able to grab that. So you better, um, because in the chat stream, it's not easy for us to pull from that after the stream ends, the comments. So maybe shoot us an email, milehighhuddle at gmail.com. We got Chris Hernandez. You know him. You love him. You met him last night. 24-year veteran of the Air Force. Skate punker at heart. Former bass player in hardcore and skate punk bands from the 90s. This is a guy that has been around the world. He's seen everything. He knows his Broncos. And he's telling you there's still time to click those little thumbs up. Appreciate you, Chris, as always, my brother. And uh, we do need to hook up at some point and continue sharing some war stories from, from the 90s. Um, <clears throat> Duran Eddings jumping back in, Zach, with a long one here. PFF is not an accurate implication of what middle linebackers can do. The Steelers finished number six overall on defense, and Barron played next to a rookie also, talking about Devin Bush. The real question is, why isn't Kareem Jackson, who was uh, outside corner, not covering teams we, uh, we play, their tight end, putting the pressure on your linebackers to guard tight ends, uh, et cetera. Kareem Jackson, top dollar, he should be covering – tight ends and the premise I don't totally disagree with Zach in terms of you know if you're lining up in man coverage yes you know get Kareem Jackson on some of these tight ends but Fangio loves using the zone he loves using he's predominantly a zone based uh, coverage scheme he mixes it up enough to keep the opponent guessing and he also mixes his own coverages up to keep the opponent guessing but you know they might <clears throat> look Without Justin Sternod, that was your only hope of really having a good coverage linebacker. And even though Alexander Johnson graded out well in coverage last year, anyone that has eyes and you know pays attention and knows football could see that he is extremely slow out there relative to slot receivers and athletic tight ends. Like he can't catch up to a tight end that can run a four or five. Guess what, dude? No offense blowing by Alexander Johnson every time unless he can jam him inside those first five yards from the line of scrimmage. So maybe the solution is, Zach, utilizing the safeties more to help against tight ends, which, by the way, last thing, tight ends weren't as big of a problem last year in Fangio's scheme as they had been under Joan, uh, Joseph and uh, Joe Woods and then Philip uh, Wade Phillips preceding him. Here's a crazy idea. How about drafting a pure inside linebacker in the earlier rounds or signing a pure inside linebacker, not have to take from other areas to make up for the deficiencies at inside linebacker? Kareem Jackson, he's a great safety. He was a good cornerback in Houston. Now he's been a really good safety in Denver. Keep him there. Don't fix what isn't broken. If you move him to inside linebacker, you take away his responsibilities at safety. You're creating another hole there opposite Justin Simmons. If Barron can be the guy to plug those holes, fine. But I, I think this is another stark reminder that Broncos have to draft better at certain spots. Inside linebacker, safety, corner, offensive tackle, they cannot keep relying on plugging these veteran last-minute pickups and expect to hold the fort against some of the NFL's premier offensive players. All right, we might be going a little bit long on tonight's show. We've crossed the one-hour mark, and there are a few superstars that are stacked up, and we don't leave our superstars out in the cold. we got Mike Evans in the house you guys met him, I think it was last week. No, the week, no, it was last week. Mike Evans joined us, and uh, he's just a phenomenal guy, and we appreciate him so much in this community. He says, appreciate y'all. How would you rank our wide receivers in the division? Zach, I would say, until proven otherwise, number two behind the Chiefs. I would rank the Broncos yeah. wide receiver core number two currently with a chance to surpass the Chiefs this year. If Judy proves to be what he seems to be, which is the truth, and maybe KJ Hamler uh, heals up quick enough to make some kind of an impact this year. Definitely. I, I don't see the Chargers. I mean, they have Keenan Allen, and it kind of, you know, it falls off after that with uh, Mike Williams. The, the, the Oakland Raiders have Tyrell Williams and Henry Ruggs. I mean, Ruggs could be good, but he's like a wide receiver two right now. Tyrell Williams isn't really a wide receiver one. The Broncos have a wide receiver one bonafide in Cortland Sutton. They have Jerry Judy, who could be a wide receiver one, definitely at worst a wide receiver two, and then KJ Hamler, who could be a wide receiver two. So yeah, on paper right now, the Chiefs still lead the lot, but you know, in in theory, the Broncos do have a great collection as well, and in a couple of years, you never know, their supporting cast can actually outweigh Kansas City's. All right, let me jump down here. And by the way, a few of our listeners uh, on Facebook are asking about Alec Ogletree. He's out there. He's available. He's a guy we mentioned on Monday night as an option. The Broncos aren't 
don't seem to be looking his way. And Kenneth, we did also, uh, Kenneth and Leroy both are asking about Wesley Woodyard. And we did talk about him. We mentioned him anyway on, on Monday night. Yes, very long in the tooth. And for that purpose, I really don't see the Broncos bringing him in. Great character guy, great leader, great community guy, but I just don't see that happening, gang. They're going with Mark Barron. There are some decent options out there, but they're going with Mark Barron. Uh, Cody Potter jumping back in. He says, uh, and thank you for the super again, my friend. Ben here and Chris Harris Jr. is getting torched by Keenan Allen. To this point, Zach, this was interesting. I watched today the third episode of Hard Knocks. And, of course, for those who aren't keeping up, Hard Knocks is following two teams this year. <clears throat> They're following both L.A. teams. So you got the Chargers and the Rams. And one of the things we wondered about, in fact, on this show, Zach, when the Broncos let Chris Harris bail and he signed with the Chargers, is we thought, ooh, that's going to be awkward, him and Keenan Allen with all that the beef and their back and forth over the years. Um, and that kind of has continued into Charger training camp. Like they're teammates and they're cool, or at least it seems like they are, but they have still been talking smack to each other and going at it. And he's hearing that Chris Harris Jr. is getting torched by Allen. I haven't heard that, uh, but I'm not paying close, close attention to what's right. happening in Chargers training camp. It wouldn't be surprising. I think Chris Harris Jr. lost a few steps last year. He's not as great of a player as he thinks he is in his own head. And Keenan Allen, say what you want about him. He's kind of a big mouth. He's, you know, he's been a thorn in the Broncos side verbally for a couple of years now, but he's a pretty damn good receiver. And I would not be surprised if he's, you know, getting the better of Chris Harris Jr. in practice. Great route runner. One of the best yes. route runners in the league is Keenan Allen. But I I still think he thinks more. <laughs> He is Keenan Allen's biggest fan. Keenan Allen is Keenan Allen's biggest fan. He thinks more of himself than, than he is. Like I, I view him as like that next level. So there's the elite wideouts, and then there's that next category, that next group of really, really good guys. The guys who you think, you know, they're the guys that when the when the guys voted into the Pro Bowl can't make it, it's the Keenan Allens that, you know, are the alternates that take their spot. He's very good, and he deserves credit, but he's not as good as he thinks he is. Uh, Mundungus right. jumping back in. Thank you, my friend. He says, Juwan James is the kind of guy that sits next to you in a movie theater and takes up both armrests. <laughs> oh, you know, that reminds people. me, I was watching the movie um, Anger Management the other night, which is, of course, Adam Sandler and Jack Nicholson. And there's that scene where the two of their, their, their two characters meet at the beginning of the movie on an airplane. And Nicholson has already sat down and he's on the, he's in a window seat and Sandler sits down next to him and puts his, his elbows on the, on the armrest. And Nicholson looks at him and goes, you're encroaching on my side of the armrest. We're not going to have a problem here. Are we? No. Anyway, <laughs> I love that movie, dude. I seriously, I've been watching it. I watch movies. I turn on a movie to fall asleep, set, set the sleep timer. I used to do it on my TV and keep my wife up all night long, but now I do it on my phone. And I've been falling asleep to anger management the last, I don't know, three, four nights. That's a good Nicholson too, Chad. Spot on. Really good. Oh, you mean my impersonation? Yeah. <laughs> We're not. Okay. Uh, Glenn Hauser jumping in. Appreciate you, bro. And uh, okay. Confirming for Wednesday. Good. He says, James used a Kleenex and got a soft tissue injury. Hashtag MHH state of being. Yeah, that's that. <laughs> He's known as a, an injury milker, and that's just the way it is. And then here's Mundungas. Appreciate you again, my friend. James uses a Kleenex, blew too hard, and his hair fell out. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, all right. Appreciate it, guys. Love the humor, keeping it funny. It's all good. All right, let me make sure we're not missing anybody. We do got to get out of here. So many good questions that we're not able to get to tonight. We might have to do another one here in the uh, – Maybe we do a bonus show at some point here in the near future. Uh, Chandler jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend. Very generous of you. Thanks getting in here late. Better late than never, my friend. He says, great show as always. I have a question. Out of the worst quarterbacks to play here the past five years, who did you hate or dislike the most? Much love. Keep up the great work and go Broncos. For me, it's no question. It's Paxton Lynch. Paxton Lynch was an embarrassment. Um. And it's so sad, Zach, because he had the size, <clears throat> you know, he had that giraffe size that John Elway seemed to covet, but he also brought some athleticism to the table. I remember as a rookie when he showed up in the preseason that first year and I saw him break the pocket for the first time, I was like, how can a dude that tall 
run that fast. And he was actually quite a smooth athlete and he had a strong arm. But between the years, Zach is where he lacked it. My answer continues to be Paxton Lynch. What do you got? Yeah, I don't see how it cannot be. I mean, he was supposed to be the savior. And when, you know, unfair expectations, you're taking over for Peyton Manning, you're replacing him. It's not an easy position to walk into. But geez, man, could you give any less effort playing video games and dabbing and never diving into the playbook and crying on the bench? I mean, he was a hype quarterback prospect for fairly good reason. The Cowboys really wanted him. And, and you know, the, they turned out in a better scenario with Dak Prescott there. But Pax and Lynch, man, one of the biggest quarterback busts of this generation and, and arguably the biggest quarterback draft bust in Broncos history. This is a question that we all can't wait to, to learn the answer. Maybe he'll be. Maybe Chris Harris Jr. Glenn says, "Who does Chris Jr. Blame, uh, Chris Harris Jr. blame first this year?" Of course, that first time he gets burned, and he'll stand up and look around. Who's he pointing the finger at? Zach. It's probably going to be. Well, you better be careful not to point it at, at uh, Derwin James, but it'll be some. It'll be Casey Hayward. It'll be someone yeah. else, or whoever that. Who's that second safety over there? King. I'm having a. Is that who? a cornerback? Justin King. I, I don't know if he's a corner or a safety. Oh, King. Uh, yeah, from Iowa. I think he's a corner. And either way, the, your premise, though, is is absolutely true. But, gang, we got to get out of here for tonight. Thank you so much to each one of you for joining us, spending some time here. We uh, love talking with you. This is our favorite episode of each and every week. So thanks for spending some time with us. Uh, mile high salute to our Super Chat superstars. We love you. We mean that. You mean everything to us. Shout out to our Facebook supporters and those of you who are watching live tonight gave us stars. It all adds up. It all helps out what Zach and I are doing, what we're all doing here at MHH. So thanks to each and every one of you. Zach and I are off on Friday, but you'll have a fresh episode of Dove Valley Deep Divers. So we'll see what Eric and Lance have cooking up, followed by Mile High Insider Saturday night. Going to be Luke and Carl again with Nick still amid his move. Um, major pain jumping in late here on super chat, Zach to say Paxton really lynched us. A eh? LOL. Yeah, Funny. it wasn't, it, it wasn't pretty. Um, so we're off. We'll be back Sunday night though. And in the meantime, make sure you follow the podcast at huddle up pod, follow the main account at mile high huddle on Twitter and my partner. You got to make sure you're following my partner on Twitter, Zach Kelberman at Kelberman NFL. You can find me at Chad and Jensen. And then of course our producer, John Buona beast, you know, him, you love him at John K M H H Zach. Have a great weekend, bro. What do you got planned? Work training camp, same old, same old. I'm, I'm sure it's more of the same for you, Chad. And uh, hopefully yep. looking forward to our next pod because we're inch by inch by day by day, closer to the regular season, right around the corner, a few weeks away. It's hard to fathom that we're right there yet. We really are. So that's exciting. Just keep your fingers crossed. We want everything today on uh, Denver Radio. Uh, I almost said Adam Sandler. Adam Schefter. <laughs> too much Adam Sandler talk tonight. Um, said, what if I told you that the NFL season is more in danger from being canceled uh, due to uh, you know social social justice than the pandemic? Let's just hope that doesn't happen. We're maintaining the cross yeah. fingers, positive – optimistic attitude. And uh, at this point, I don't think there's any reason to doubt that, but gang, we got to get out of here for tonight. We'll see you on Sunday. Have a great weekend, everybody stay safe, be smart, enjoy your families. And uh, we'll see you Sunday for Zach Kelberman, for John, 